Well, uh, if you were expecting to turn to uh, the Gospel of John this morning, uh, well, I'd encourage you to turn elsewhere. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5. The reason I ask you this morning to turn to Hebrews chapter 5 is because um, we're going to move into John chapter 6 after I come back from vacation next week, and, uh, and I didn't want to split that message up uh, in two weeks. So uh, I'd like to move with you this morning to a passage of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Uh, I came across a story yesterday morning, actually. I hadn't originally planned to tell the story, but uh, sometimes you, you hear something and you just got to tell as many people as you can with whatever time you have, I suppose. But I read a story about a, about a young man that went off to college uh, yesterday morning, and his mama was worried about him, and she handed him a, a brand new copy of God's Word. She wrote his name in it, and she wrote a scripture reference in the front of that. And the man went off to college, and... Uh, he did what many folks do when they go off to college. Uh, it was party after party, uh, and pretty soon he found himself with absolutely no money uh, to support the habits that he had picked up once he got to college. And so he decided one day the last thing that the man had left to pawn or to sell was that copy of God's Word that his mama had given him. So he went down to the local pawn shop and he pawned it for some money to buy whiskey. Now, you might think that this might have a sad ending, but eventually uh, the man did graduate college, and he became a doctor in a very large hospital, a very successful doctor. And he had a patient that was on his deathbed in that hospital, uh, and the man would just consistently and constantly say, sir, is there anything I can do for you? The nurses would ask, sir, is there anything I could do for you? And the man just always simply told them, Give me, can I have my book? Can I have my book? Right before the man passed, he asked that hospital, he asked that doctor, uh, may I have my book? And so he handed the book that was on the stand to the man. The man ended up passing just a few minutes later. Now right after the man had breathed his last, that doctor, as soon as he had announced the time of death, he, he picked up that book and he opened it. Right there in the front was his name and a scripture reference. It was his Bible that he had pawned off. This is a true story. That man eventually, uh, he left med medicine and he became a minister of the gospel. And he's the writer of that hymn, Revive Us Again. I was talking to someone last week. That's one of those stories. I love those books, Then Sings My Soul. John McCall is the one that got me introduced to those things. There's a lot of wonderful stories behind some of these hymns we sing. I didn't know what Zach was going to talk about this morning. And I heard a lot come out as he gave us his heart this morning for, for the church and for the Lord. But the thing that just constantly kept ringing to me because I knew what I was about to come preach about was revival. Survival. Revival is not something that we plan as a church, though we like to plan these different services every fall and to call them Revival. Revival is something that has been on my heart a lot lately. And it's because of a, a quote that I keep written in the very front of this little notebook that I carry in my shirt pocket, and on Sunday morning I carry it in my jacket pocket. It's this. It's a quote from Spurgeon that says, If we want revival, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. If we want revival, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. I think I've told you this before, but that's my goal here at Oakland Baptist Church. And certainly, sure, my, my, my ultimate goal is the glory of God in all things. That's supposed to be our goal. Whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, it ought to be done for the glory of God. And sure, my goal here is the evangelization of the lost. But here's the thing, church. None of that stuff ever happens without an emphasis on the Word of God. We started this several months ago, but if you will, let's stand together as we show reverence to God and to His Word as I read our passage for this morning, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. This is the inspired, the inerrant, the infallible Word of God. It says this, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. 
You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Let's pray. Father, it is a joy, Lord, to gather here today, God, with your people, Lord, with your church, for your glory. God, I pray that, that you meet with us here today on the pages of Scripture. Father, we, we desire to commune with you in this place. God, that we might know more fully our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, and the power of his resurrection. Father, work in our hearts this morning. Draw us into deeper relationship with you. God, I pray you tend to my words, that you use them for what you would have to take place, for your honor, and for the praise of your name. Lord, I pray that this moment be a time of genuine worship. Father, and that it be a time, Lord, that we might not soon forget. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may take your seats. Well, this is not normal for me to jump and to, and to pick up in the middle of a book or, or a portion of the way through the book. I, like, I prefer preaching uh, through books of God's Word. The book of Hebrews is a series of exhortations. Uh, it's one of my favorite books in Scripture. I know I tell you that every week or every time we come to a new passage, but uh, that's the beauty of God's Word, folks. The first of the exhortations as we come through the book of Hebrews is in chapter 2. It says this in verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The writer moves on from there through chapters 3 and 4. He says in Hebrews 3, 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you any evil, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. In this passage for this morning, the author gives us a third exhortation. And it is quite possibly one of the most severe warnings, I think, in all of the New Testament. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says this, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Now, here's the thing, church. The writer doesn't mean that everybody needs to be a complete expositor of God's Word. He doesn't mean that everybody ought to be a pastor, but he does mean this. He does mean that they ought to be able to teach others the basics of the faith. But here's the thing. The people to whom he wrote this letter, they hadn't even grasped the most elementary truths of the gospel. They hadn't even grasped the most elementary truths of the faith. Those to whom this letter was written are like many Christians today to believe that theology is a waste of time. A very big name in Christianity. This rubbed me very badly. There's a very big name in Christianity today that, that recently stated, church unity is more important than being theologically correct. It came out of the man's mouth in those words. Some of you might even agree with that, but listen this morning. True church unity... True unity among Christians, it can only occur by agreement on the, truth, on the truths of Scripture. People will say at times, what difference does it make if God is a Trinitarian God? What difference does it make whether regeneration comes before or after faith? What difference does it make if Jesus was born of a virgin? What difference does it make if I believe in the, in the atonement? People will say, well, what is important is that we all get along. And they use passages such as those... Uh, that commend childlike faith in an attempt to support their argument. But hear, hear this, folks. Childlike faith is not the same as a childish faith. Those two things are not the same thing. Many believers today attempt to nourish themselves with a steady diet of milk. And listen, folks, milk's not a bad thing. Milk is a very good thing, especially if you get it from Richland's. They got good milk out there. I mean, milk is used to make cheese. I like cheese, too. That's good. Milk is used to make ice cream. Have you ever seen anybody with a frown on their face while they eat a cone of ice cream? I certainly haven't. 
Look, milk is a very good thing. Babies, listen, they are one of my favorite things in this entire world. I absolutely love babies. Every single one of them. And, and I think one of the hardest parts about the coronavirus for me personally is the fact that I hadn't gotten to hold all these babies that we got in the church right now. Uh, we had another one born uh, this past week. Little Chandler Antill. I hadn't gotten to see her yet, although I was the first one probably out of all of you to get a picture. You ought to be jealous. Man. But I, but I want to be there, and I want to hold those babies. I, I hadn't gotten to see little McKenna Crutchfield in months. Uh, I haven't gotten to hold uh, Joe Lynn like I used to get to all the time. I haven't gotten to hold Malin. Heck, her hair changed colors between times when I even got to see her. Here's the thing, folks. If I wasn't a pastor, uh, I'd try real hard to find something to do with my life where I just got to spend all of my time around babies because I love them. First thing a baby ever eats is what? Milk. Milk. And listen, it keeps that child going for a little while. It keeps them alive uh, for a little while. But what's eventually going to have to happen if that baby is going to grow? They're going to need something else. They're going to need some real food. And look, if they don't, they're going to die. They're not just going to stay the same size. They're not going to remain a baby forever. If they don't get real food, they're going to die. Look, there is no such thing as a stagnant faith. There is no such thing. You are either progressing in your faith. You are either becoming more and more like Christ, falling deeper in love with Him, or you're falling away from Him. There is no in-between. You're either moving forward or you're regressing in your faith, but you are not staying still. We, we live in a time, folks, we, we live in a world where Christians are content in their ignorance of the Scriptures. We live in a time when Christians say they believe everything that the Bible teaches, but they don't know anything that the Bible teaches. Most Christians can't tell you what it means to be justified. Most Christians can't tell you where the book of Zephaniah is in the Bible, much less probably even the book of Psalms. They don't know the difference between Moses and Paul. I, I recently came across a statistic, statistic, and I may have even shared this, I think, on Easter Sunday out at Camp Kahuki, but, man, I can't shake this thing. There is a statistic that was put out Somebody went up to all these Christians, all these people that profess faith in Christ, and he asked them this, does the Bible actually say God helps those who help themselves, yes or no? 80% of people that called themselves evangelical Christians, 80% said that that was out of the Bible. You will not find that quote or idea anywhere in the pages of Scripture. Y'all remember who actually said that? Benjamin Franklin. Spiritual infants, the world is full of them. It's full of them. People that claim that they have been walking with Jesus for 50 years. But here's the thing, folks. They've got one hand on Jesus and they've got one hand on the world or they've got one hand on Jesus and one hand on whatever else that other thing might be. Look, folks, it takes both hands to walk with the Lord because here's what happens. One hand over here is holding on to the Lord and I would argue that he's holding on to me far more than I'm holding on to him and the other one better have a copy of God's word in it. It takes both hands for us to walk with the Lord. The, the author of Hebrews, he continues on in verse 13, he says this. Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Folks, abortion might be at an all-time high, and I hate it. I hate it. It might be on an all-time high, but listen, there are still babies everywhere. There are spiritual babies everywhere. People that aren't able to articulate the basis of their salvation, people that can't even tell you biblically how it was that they came to faith in Jesus. They might identify with him, they might have the T-shirt. They might have the date written in the back of their Bible about when they profess faith in Christ. But they can't eat solid food. They're what I call toothless Christians. Does it matter? Does it matter whether or not you can, or whether you do, become mature in the faith? Does it really matter what I know as long as I know Jesus? I would submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that it absolutely does. It absolutely does. Ephesians 4. And I use this passage so often. I read this at least weekly. 
Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11, it tells us this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of Man, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why, Paul? Why? He says this, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. He said it a little while ago. Speaking the truth in love. And your pastor is not perfect at that, folks. I have failed in that, and I do fail at that in times. But I trust God to continue to work that in me as he completes that which he started. He continues, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Friends, for the true Christian, there's no disconnect between the heart and the mind. We hear all the time, many men have said it before, uh, that salvation is about an eight, people miss it by about 18 inches sometimes. I'm kind of short and stocky, so I don't know if that's 18 inches for me. It's probably more like nine. But for the true Christian, folks, there is no disconnect between here and here. When we are saved, folks, we receive a new heart. God, God said through the prophet Ezekiel, I'll give you a new heart. And a new spirit I'll put within you. I will remove your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. Paul says in 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That old one's gone. He's not here anymore. He's gone. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He says in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Look, when the, when the Lord saves us, we receive a new heart and our mind is changed and our affections begin to change, don't they, folks? We, could, we are different people when we come to Christ. We begin to fall out of love with this life and we fall in love with the life to come. We begin to fall out of love with our sin and we fall in love with righteousness and, and with holiness. We fall out of love Men, we fall out of love with the dirty magazines and the dirty websites when we come to Christ. Ladies, you fall out of love with the, the dirty novels when you come to Christ. And you fall in love with God's Word. That we that I speak of is the truly converted. But the carnal Christian which is many Christians today, they're bored with God's Word. They're bored with the Bible. Folks, if you can sit down with God's Word and it can't hold your attention, you've got far more problems than perhaps being ADD. A man or a woman that loves Jesus Christ, you sit down with this book and it captivates you. Folks today are bored with theology. They're bored with the Bible, and both of those are just ways of saying, folks, that we are bored with God himself. If you find yourself, folks, bored with God's word, listen, you will be virtually helpless against false teaching. You won't be able to discern between truth and falsehood. I'll get through these quickly this morning. But we're given three identifiers here of the toothless Christian. Number one, toothless Christians are shallow in their understanding. Paul says in verse 11, we've got much to teach you, but we can never get to it because you were dull of hearing. He says, look, we can't move to the tough stuff because you haven't grasped the easy stuff yet. Look, does that describe you folks? Let me ask you that this morning. And look, it's not a contest to see who knows the most, folks. That's not what church is about. That's not what being brothers and sisters is about. But let me ask you, do you have an affection for the Word of God? Uh, do, you, do you long for the time each day that you get to spend time with Jesus on the pages of his book? Do you long for that time? Do you, do you long for the spiritual growth that only occurs when you spend time with God and his Word? Some will say, well, it doesn't matter uh, what I know about Jesus as long as I know him. 
To which I would say, how do you know that the Jesus you claim to love is the Jesus from this Bible if you don't read his word? If you don't do that, you will never, you will never grow in your faith and you will never be of any use to God. You will never be a faithful witness for Christ. It leads me to number two. Toothless Christians are of very little use to other people. Verse 12, he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Folks, there's a lot of Christians out there that think that the work of the ministry is just up to the pastors and the evangelists and the missionaries. But look again at that verse I mentioned a few moments ago, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip, to equip. That's my job, It's to equip you to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. My job, look, and Zach's job, should you feel what our, pers- our, our, um, our uh, personnel committee feels, that he's the one that God would have to serve as our associate pastor. Look, my job and the job of the associate pastor in this church is to equip other people for ministry. It's not just our job to understand the deep doctrines of this book. That is the responsibility of every single believer. Everyone. A father, without a mature understanding of God's word, he cannot sufficiently lead lead his wife, his children, his family in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. He can't. Y'all know this about me already. I'm hard on men. I'm hard on you. Brothers, it is our responsibility to lead our families. You don't get to pass that off to someone else. I didn't write it. It's just my job to proclaim it. Some of you are, are, uh, you hear things like that and you become um, depressed because you're a little bit more seasoned. And so when I say things like that, you're like, shoot, well, I wasted it. Look, it's not too late to start. It is never too late to start. It's never too late to start unless you wait till tomorrow. What about ladies? I love you, but uh, you don't get off so easy either. Remember what Paul says in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy? Uh, In the days that we live in right now, folks, uh, a lot of you will remember these verses, but you won't remember the, the verse right after it. Paul says this, but understand this that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Nod your head if you know where it's... Y'all remember the verses. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Remember what Paul says? He says, avoid those people. Paul says, avoid such people. Oh, and here it is, ladies. For among them, among them are those who creep into households and they capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. We're not all just responsible for what we know, but what we do not know. I'm responsible uh, as your shepherd, not only for what I do teach you, but for what I don't teach you. I've got to answer for both. We need each of us, folks, every single one of us, not just the pastors or the deacons, but every member, every person that is a Christian. Look, we need each of us. As Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, we need to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Look, Christians ought to be like Boy Scouts. Not in every way necessarily, but we ought to be like Boy Scouts in that they are supposed to always be prepared. We are to be prepared. We need to always be prepared to do good to the souls of our fellow men. And the third mark. This morning, of the toothless Christian, they can't differentiate between the truth and a lie. Verse 14, it tells us that the mature, the spiritually mature, they're able to discern between good and evil. But look, folks, that does not come by osmosis. 
That is not by osmosis. Verse 14 again, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. Constant practice. We receive discernment through constant practice, constantly and consistently spending time with God and His Word, constantly repenting of our sin, constantly having our minds changed and our, and our faith grown as we, as we come to the Word of God. I'll close with this. Uh, let me ask you this morning. Zach was drawn by the fact that we're a family here. We're a family. So we get personal with one another sometimes. So let me get real personal with you this morning. Let me, uh, quote unquote, get up in your business. Are you a, are you a mature believer that feasts on the meat of God's word? Or do you still need to be bottle fed? That, mo- that bottle might help you to sleep at night. But listen, if the Father doesn't take that away, if you're not willing to give it up, you'll have no ability to know whether or not the words that are entering your ears as you step out into this world, you'll have no ability or discernment to know whether or not they are true. You'll be of very little use to your fellow brothers and sisters, and you will never, ever grow in your faith. You won't. You want to grow, you've got to be fed. There's no, I've said this before. There's no such thing as a Christian vegetarian. That is the most Baptist sentence that will ever come out of my mouth, I'm sure. There's no such thing as a Christian vegetarian. Boy, we like to eat, and uh, my pants are kind of thanking me right now, but, man, I'd love to sit down and have a meal with y'all. But look, folks, we need meat. Christians need meat. Not just the fried chicken. We need the turkey. We need the ham. We need the, we need the roast beef and the steak and the squirrel and the rabbit and the, and the pig's feet. We need all the meat of God's word. And it's as if the writers of these 66 books, there's others, but, but Moses and David and Solomon and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul, it's as if they're on the pages of Scripture. They're like that Arby's commercial. We have the meats. We have the meats. In the garden, that serpent said to Eve, Adam with her, says, take, eat, take, eat. And it changed the lives of every person that was ever born after them. Jesus sat uh, at the table with the the disciples on the night that he was betrayed. And he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it changed the lives of those disciples and every disciple that would come after them. And I would to tell you, I would tell you today, take, eat. This is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God. And it alone will change your life. Bow with me, church. If we want revival, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. Father, I pray, Lord, that as a body, that we would love, that we would honor, that we would cherish Your Word. God, the only way that we can do that as a body is if we individually love, honor, and cherish Your Word. And as we can do nothing pleasing to you apart from the working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray your Spirit would work in each of us in this body in such a way that we would, that we would trust your word. As the hymn goes, it will sing in just a moment. Lord, coming now to thee, O Christ, my King, trusting only in thy precious word, let my, let, let our humble prayer to thee be heard send a great revival in my soul God I pray in our souls Father I pray if there's a person in here that's not a Christian 
that the eyes of their hearts, Lord, that it might be opened, that your grace and salvation would be absolutely irresistible to them, that they would respond to your invitation to repent and believe the gospel this morning. God, if another needs to be baptized this morning, make them willing to make that decision. Father, make each of us lovers of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.